Our second speaker tonight is uh, Wendy Grater. Um, um, she's going to talk to us tonight about what I consider a frankly sexist uh, ski trip across IUE took. Hello, hello. Whoa, very loud. Well, hello everyone. It's awesome to be here and see so many friends and outdoor enthusiasts. I hope you're having a great evening. So tonight I'm gonna to talk about um, the Arctic Challenge, which was a two-week ski touring expedition across Baffin Island's Ayuitak National Park. Um, it went from the north part of the park to the south part, and it was 18 women. That may seem like a lot. It was. Um, I actually organized and coordinated it for a company called Lease Plan, which is an international, well, multinational company that was based in um, the UK in London, and they contacted me about a year and a half ago saying that they wanted to do an expedition to sort of promote gender equality in the workforce and diversity. Not just in the workforce, but just in people's consciousness. Well, this sort of appealed to me, being a woman, and uh, so I thought, well, this would be kind of interesting. So over the next couple of months, we designed a program to take some of their employees, some of their female employees, on this Arctic challenge. They had a launch of this, and over 150 of their employees signed up to try out for this. It was incredibly popular. And so over three weekends that they had up in Scotland, in the high um, kind of highlands of Scotland, they whittled the number down to the team of 15. So that's like 10%. Um, they did all sorts of things to get them ready. And um, finally, April 10th of last year, the team arrived at the Ottawa airport. So this was pretty exciting. They'd been, uh, they were chosen, the team was chosen in September of 2014. And this was um, April of 2015 that we arrived at the airport. So there were 15 of these women from Lease Plan. They had never skied before. And three female black feather guides, myself, Katya Mathis, and Jane Whitney. Um, so from the Ottawa airport, Many of you guys who have traveled to the north with First Air, which is Canada's airline of the north, you fly up over northern Quebec and then up onto Baffin, and, and the first stop is Iqaluit, which is the capital of Nunavut. So there was a two-hour layover in Iqaluit, so the ladies, the team, of course, wanted to get out and see what the north was all about, and so here they are visiting some of the hot spots, the northern store, the Arctic survival store, and finally came back to the airport to find out that, lo and behold, our first Arctic challenge was that our next flight, going from Iqaluit up to the little community of Kikatarjuak that we were starting, that flight was cancelled. And there wasn't going to be another flight for two days. So enthusiasm sort of plummeted, and of course, we were on the phones trying to figure out what to do to solve this problem because we only had so many days to do this trek and we wanted a day in Kikatarjuak to do a shakedown day, get on our skis, you know, do a bunch of things there. So I was already up in Kik ahead of time to make sure that our food and gear and everything was there. Katya and Jane, the other two guides, were coming up with the crew and so I was on the phone to them they, and to our office in Perry Sound and to Lease Plan in London, England, trying to solve this problem. And finally, we did solve it. We managed to charter two smaller aircraft instead of the one um, going on the SCED flight. So by this time, it was 3.30 or 4 in the afternoon. Here is part of the team with the one aircraft, the other team, part of the team with the second aircraft. And in the center there is, whoops, I just turned off. Center, uh, let's see if I got, that's Katya, the other guide, and Jane here, and these are all team members. 
And so they started flying north and managed to arrive in Kikatarjuak, the little town, at about 7 o'clock at night, just as the stars were coming out. And uh, by this time, it's like minus 30 degrees, and uh, the ladies were quite excited to be there. So Kikatarjuak is on the north shore, or the north coast of Baffin Island. It used to be called Broughton Island. It's a small village of about 650 people that live very traditionally. They would hunt, fish, um, gather off the land, um, and live a fairly, fairly traditional lifestyle. We took over the Tulagak Hotel, which means Raven Hotel, it has eight rooms, so we were two to a room and basically, as I said, took up the whole hotel for the two nights that we were there. And that gave us the opportunity to uh, do a kind of trip briefing and then the next day get out on the snow. You will notice that Lease Plan's official corporate colors are orange and black, so you'll see a lot of orange and black as we go through this. So our idea, or not our idea, our plan, we started here in Kikatarjuak. We were going to get a snowmobile ride down the North Pangnertung Fjord to the start of the Ashwak Pass, which is also called the Pangnertung Pass. We are going to ski through the Pangnertung Pass to Overlord, where you meet the Pangnertung Fjord, and then get a snowmobile the 30 kilometers out to Pang. This is about a distance of 100 kilometers that we will be doing over 12 days, 12 nights out. So that's our basic plan. And as I mentioned, the first day was a shakedown day that we were going to just get on our skis for the first time for the ladies, um, get out on the flat sea ice and learn a few techniques, and uh, set up our tents, try that out, and try setting up our bear fence. If you know anybody from the UK or Europe is absolutely petrified of bears, particularly polar bears. And it wasn't very likely that we were to see a bear, but part of the agreement I had to sign was, in order to do this trip with this group was that we would set up a bear fence each night. So it was a bit of a pain in the butt, but that was one of the things we did. Um, so anyways, uh, here are two of the team with their skis on and uh, of course, we attracted a fair amount of interest from the community. There were a couple of kids that came down to see if they could jump on the back of the skis. The team, though, was very well prepared. Even though they didn't have any experience with cross-country skiing or ski touring, the company had, A, hired their Olympic cross-country skier. Yes, UK does have a cross-country skier who is an Olympian. And he came out and did roller skiing lessons with them. So these women had roller skied. They had each been given a personal trainer for the six months prior to the trip to get themselves in shape. They had hauled um, t tires behind them up and down streets. So they had done a fair amount of work. And of course, the company had purchased for them a complete kit, including down parkas and pants and that sort of thing. So they were pretty well prepared for what they were getting into. So the next day, we headed off on these comatics and snowmobiles. And we were heading the 50 or 60 kilometers from the town of Kik into North Pang Fjord. Um, this is probably one of the colder things you could do in your life, sitting in one of these little uh, sleds, going along at 50 kilometers an hour um, is pretty chilly actually. So here we are with all of our gear jammed in here and zooming along. We would stop about once every hour for a break, um, answer the call of nature, and uh, just see the spectacular scenery that we are in. You can see that it's blue sky, um, quite cold. We had temperatures that were probably minus 20 to minus 40 degrees. It was quite a cold snap there at the time that we were there. But regardless, it was very, very neat. And just for me, after working on this for almost a year, and honestly, for the about two months prior to it, I would wake up every night worrying about something. 
Are the skis going to get there? What about this? Does soap for your dishes freeze? What do you do about this? What do you do about that? So I learned lots, and, uh, but it was really great to finally be there and doing it. So after about um, five to six hours of ride on the snow, snow machines and comatex, we got to the North Pang, uh, the North Pang uh, start of the trip and had our first experience with setting up our tents and finding our gear and getting ourselves organized. Um, at this point too, um, as I mentioned, we were figuring out, or for the first time, setting up our polar bear fence around and finding out that soon as the wind blew, the fence would fall over because you've got basically very hard packed snow and ice and it was really difficult to get it in. So um, we set it up the best we could, but uh, had to um, kind of hope or no, we, we relied on the fact that there really aren't at this time of year polar bears in that area. The next day we woke up to a howling windstorm and very, very cold conditions. It took us quite a long time, as you can imagine, from a, any trip like this, a canoe trip, a sea kayaking trip, a hiking trip, it takes a day or two just to get your systems down, just to figure out how to pack your sleds, how to take your tents down, how you're going to get up in the morning. And so by noon, we were ready to start our trek after struggling away for quite a few hours, getting ourselves organized. And here we are starting off, pulling our sleds, there isn't, as you can see, an awful lot of snow. The snow that happens gets blown. I don't know where it ends up, but it doesn't end up in the pass. It's just pretty well continually a uh, wind blowing. So you have um, a condition where you have, you can see little shoots of grass that come up through, but in any little hollow, there would be a snow thing. So it is good to have your skis on so that you can um, ski through it. However, I did also mention that these women didn't have a lot of experience on skis. So within the first kilometer, one woman falls, trips, and twists her ankle. She thinks it's dislocated. And again, this is minus 30 degrees, blowing wind. You can't really open up a foot and take a look at it. So we did manage to get her onto a sled and come back to the initial campsite where there is an emergency shelter. So we get back to the shelter, manage to get her back there, and um, by this time it's 4.35 in the afternoon. So I had decided that yes, we'll just camp here again, we'll analyze her foot, see how it's doing, make some tea. Tea always helps, doesn't it? <laughs> Particularly with a British group. And um, lo and behold, just as we're making the tea and people are set setting up the tents again, I hear the sound of a snow machine. It's like, well, what's happening here? So along comes a snow machine. Some Inuit guy comes off of it. There are about three of them out there, three Inuit people, two snow machines. And it turns out that they were traveling from the town of Pangnertung at the south end up to Kikatarjuak and we're just stopping briefly, saw our tents, and sort of with sign language and whatever, I said, can you take this woman back to Kiktarjawak? He agrees and takes her to the medical center. Luckily, and I'm thinking of the last presentation, I had a satellite phone, so I could phone the medical center there and say, we're sending somebody with a, you know, injured foot back to you. So that worked out very, very well. She could leave that afternoon, headed back, and uh, was safely there by 10 o'clock at night and was expected, so that was great. The rest of us stayed out there and I found out the next morning that Kim, what was her name, couldn't continue as she had torn a ligament in her foot, so we were down one team member, so 17 instead of 18. So here we are the next morning packing up. It's still pretty windy, but looking pretty good and I fear we've got to get moving. I could also tell what, with what had happened the day before and the conditions that we really did have to move. I don't know if you can sense that when a trip um, is pretty much beginning and they were worried about Kim and they were worried about whether they could accomplish this and they were worried about the temperatures and I knew that if we didn't move then that their confidence would just drop. And I was getting 
messages from lease plan in London, like maybe you should pull the plug, maybe you should pull the plug, and I would just would not answer. I just <laughs> kept going. <laughs> Sometimes you just, and I spoke to them later about this, I said, I, you wanted this to succeed. I knew it could succeed. I knew these women could do it, and we just had to put one foot ahead of the other and start moving. And if I devoted any of my energy to worrying about you in London, I wouldn't be able to do it. I had to devote all of my positive energy to making these women succeed. So as we continued along, we got down to the Owl River and started following that, and things really started to look up. It was much easier pulling our sleds on the Owl River than up on the tundra. And um, people were starting, I could see, even within the first couple of hours, to think, okay, this could be possible. We would have some laughs, stop for breaks to have tea in our thermoses, some lunch. And I quickly learned that lunch, well, you have to think of it differently than on a canoe trip. You can't just pull out the cheese and cut it because it's totally frozen solid. <laughs> totally. And our tuna, which were in little packages, were like totally frozen. You'd have to stick it in your mouth for like five minutes to thaw it out, and then you could sort of eat it. So the first day's lunch was not super good, and in fact, Charlotte, who was in, we had a little cooking group, Charlotte, who was our youngest guy, she had a wicked sense of humor, and she'd be like, this tuna, this is so great. <laughs> it's like, not. <laughs> Anyways, we continued on. Um, you can see the scouring of the wind and got to our second campsite. We started to choose places to camp that had little depressions where the snow would gather. It was a lot easier to get our snow stakes into snow than trying to put a peg into totally frozen tundra. So we would always be camped on little spots like this. We had red sleeping tents, and the little um, yellow things that you see were our cooking shelters. So we, with the 17 of us now, we had three cooking groups. Um, there were two groups of six and one of five. That makes 17. And inside those cooking shelters, we can have two MSR stoves. We could always had our bigger pot going for water. Um, it was a continual continual melting snow and ice for water, enough for people to drink, have in their thermoses, make tea, hot chocolate, anything. And then the other stove was generally our cooking stove. So Katya had one group, I had another group, and Jane had another group. And we ended up deciding that we would actually travel in our cooking groups as well. Luckily, we seemed quite, quite matched to our group. Katya's quite a determined athlete and her group were all seemed to be athletes. I'm kind of this laid back sort of nice person, and my group was really nice. I really, you know, they were always hugging each other, like every picture they're hugging each other. And Jane, she's like an off the wall person. She's got this bizarre sense of humor, and her group was like totally random. So for some reason, we all just suited each other and got along famously, in our tents anyways. We used a Hilleberg tents, which is a tunnel type tent, quite lightweight, um, quite comfortable. And we used the Hilleberg three person tents for two people. I don't know how they ever expect three people to get in one of these tents, but maybe you guys do it. I've, because in a winter situation like this with big down bags, um, the parkas and all that sort of thing, um, you really take up a lot of room. It's interesting for me to think that um, probably what I took the most of that I didn't use was clothes. Because basically I wore the same thing for two weeks. Same, like I, like, did I really change my underwear? It's too darn cold. Like you just wear what you're wearing. And at night all I would do is take off my down pants and my parka, put on another down coat and get into my sleeping bag. Everything just stayed the same, just right in. 
And in the morning, all I have to do is like put your parka back on. Boom, there you go, ready to go. But the other interesting thing is it's like, because of your breath, inside the tent, it's just like snowflakes, like, like frost, right? So as soon as you sit up, you get snowed upon in the morning. So the, you wake up to this lovely cold shower. Anyways, um, the other piece of the puzzle beyond our cooking shelter and our sleeping tents was our sleds. And um, they were, their sleds made by Pelican and they had little covers that go over them and we would have everything we need in there, our sleeping bag, thermarest. Um, we put our uh, ridge rest, which protected us, uh, our thermarest from the snow. Some days we didn't have to use our skis, so they would get tied on. We had our stoves, um, food, all that sort of stuff in these sleds. Mine was, all the guides were pretty heavy because we ended up with first aid, repair, sat phones, in reach, you name it, we had it. And uh, so at first they were pretty heavy to pull, but as we ate through some of our food, they did get lighter as we went along. Yeah, so the other thing that we learned pretty quickly is what is good snow to pull on and what is bad snow. Don't pull on anything that has sand in it because, well, you know, sandpaper. So we'd be trying to be on the ice most of the time. We'd probably do 10 kilometers in a day, averaging getting going by 10, 30, or 11 in the morning. That's with getting up at 7. By the time you boil water, it takes a long time. Some beautiful scenery, though, and an incredible Arctic light. And that's my little nice group. <laughs> so the next night, we camped up on the hillside. We had to sort of haul up a little bit to get enough snow to find a place to put up all of our tents and everything. And that's, whoops, back. Where's Mount, a there's Mount Asgard which is the flat top mountain right up at Summit and Glacier Lakes. So when we, got up, when we get to there, we know that we're sort of halfway through, but we're still a couple of days trek from there. I got in the habit each evening of going for about a 45 to an hour walk before I went to bed after dinner. I really enjoyed that time just to walk without my sled and also just to warm up a bit, take a look at the scenery, just really appreciate being out there and the magic that the North has. And sometimes when you're in the middle of doing stuff and pulling and getting the stove going, you don't really appreciate that until you make yourself take that extra little bit of time by yourself or with a friend to just experience it. So the next day, I would say, was our hardest day. It was sort of that day that we'd been out there for quite a few. People had, were getting tired. There were a few cases of a little bit of frostbite on the face that we'd dealt with, but people were still pretty nervous and, and unsure. And it was really windy, really, really windy. If you let go of anything, your mitten, your ski pole, it just went, it, it flew and you'd have to run and try to jump on it or have somebody else. So we were very, very, very careful about any time we stopped. I told you about people hugging themselves all the time. Well, partially for cold, partially just to gain strength from each other. Um, Annie, who was our smallest person, also in our, my group, she was so tiny, you know, maybe she's under five feet and just a light little thing she would get blown off her feet. So we ended up tying her to the strongest person in our group. So we had like a person, a sled, then a rope coming to Annie to pull her so that she would make it along. At this point, we're using ice grippers instead of our um, skis. We had um, the yak tracks, if anybody's heard of those, ice grippers, and they have a, a professional model which have very good um, grips on them, kind of like a crampon, but not quite as substantial. As I said, with the gang though, there was always some laughter. There was always a time, even in the hardest times, that someone would crack a joke or just say, hey, guess where we are? We're here. We're here. And this is what we've worked for. Now, so you can see Katya coming along here and you can kind of sense the wind coming on a diagonal 
and her sled is being pulled off to one side. Generally, she and I took turns, she and I, our, our groups took turns in the lead, and uh, Jane's random group was always at the back of the pack. So um, it was really nice to make camp that night. Uh, it had been a tough day into the wind, um, one of those days that you work very hard and you feel a sense of accomplishment. The team was pretty whacked. They had spent now three days pulling sleds that they weren't really used to and in temperatures and conditions that they weren't really used to. So after their tents were up, they pretty quickly crawled into them. Luckily, we were at a spot where there is an emergency shelter in the park. So um, Katya here and Jane took up they went in there and they lit the stoves and they started to make tea, then soup, then dinner. And I stayed on the outside helping getting things set up and then ferrying hot meals to everybody in the tent. So that took us about two and a half or three hours. And finally, we got to crawl into our own little tents and relax at the end of the day. But the next morning dawned bright and still, and it just felt amazing. What a change to not have the wind absolutely battering you. And that day we had our biggest climb, about 200 meters from where we had camped the night before, which is called the Glacier Lake Cabin. And we were climbing up over the call and then down the other side to Glacier Lake. So the first, um, the morning was spent doing this gradual ascent. First of all, the ascent was pretty gradual, and then it got a little steeper, and we ended up having to hitch two people per sled in order to get up the final part. So we would leave one sled behind, go up, turn back, and bring up the second sled, kind of like doubling back on a portage trail. So finally we got to the top, there's Katya with her GoPro trying to uh, get a sense of all of us there, and we decided that we would have our lunch before heading down the other side. And we had come up from the valley floor below and had a, came up through the call here. And of course, lunchtime, I mentioned the first lunch, we weren't very successful. We had now uh, a system in place that when we were cooking breakfast, we would also thaw out what we needed for lunch. So we would thaw the cheese, we'd thaw the peanut butter. You have to actually put your peanut butter in the boiling water pot that you're boiling for drinks, and it gradually thaws so you can spread it. And then you make your sandwich and you put it down your shirt. So you've got it like sort of in between your long underwear and your parka and your things. And every so often, of course, it falls out. Like I, whoops, I just laid m an egg. No, my lunch. But um, there's our uh, lunch coming out. You've heard about the bagel oven. Well, so then after lunch, we came down the other side of the call towards Glacier Lake. And this was our first experience with lowering sleds down and so that's quite fun. It's quite, it was quite a convoluted uh, route that we took. You can see the, I'd mentioned the snowmobile that came up, um, and that is their route there. So we were sort of following that snowmobile trail down. And happily, we made it down to Glacier Lake with no injuries or uh, incidents. And our objective at this point is to cross over Glacier Lake to the other side, and there was a little kind of bay or sheltered nook area that I figured from the map looked like a place we could camp right down below Mount Asgard and at the foot of the Turner Glacier, if anybody's done any hiking up there. Very spectacular spots. So here is our camp for the night, our three little cooking shelters, our tents set up, and uh, getting ready for the evening. And this again is my evening hike as the sun's going down. The other thing is it's amazing how much you can sleep in a situation like this. So we would normally be going bed to bed by 7.30 or 8 at night and not getting up till 7.30 or 8 the next morning. And somehow that was just fine. <laughs> and that's a slightly blurred picture but uh, of the camp. But the next morning, very different, beautiful Mount Asgard in the background, our little tent group, 
And you can see here that um, any morning like this that was sort of bright and still, we would try to get our sleeping bags out, put them over our skis, which we're on, and it would just sort of sublimate. If you bang them a little bit, you would get any of the dampness out of it, then stuff them into the sleeping bags, and away you go. And here we are at, uh, with Mount Asgard in the background. So I think at this stage I noticed that people's spirits started to rise. There was a sense that we were, hey, maybe almost halfway there, and that maybe this was going to work. I mean, I knew it was going to work right from the word go, and I'm really stubborn. So, but you can't tell somebody that. You have to let them figure that out. So the next day we headed across Glacier Lake and we were going to go down into Summit Lake and to the far end. In the distance here you see Mount Thor, which is um, a very notable mountain in Ayuitak National Park. It's got a 5,000 vertical foot face of granite and it was gonna, it'll take us two days to get down to there. And that's another one called Mount Loki and that's the Norman Glacier that we're going by. If I were to do this trip again, which I would love to actually, so if anybody wants to do it, maybe next year in April, but um, it would be nice to spend two or three days in this area, this Glacier Lake area, because there's some great touring you could do. Set up a base camp and ski up some of these glaciers or around this area. It'd be very, very cool to do a bit more exploration. Anyways, we're down onto Summit Lake now, and again, our uh, lunch break. Can you guess which way the wind's coming from? <laughs> yeah, you got it. And then heading our final bit of our ski. It's really interesting to see the snow as well. You see all different sort of shapes and um, you can see the wind blown and you can hear it too. You know that squeak, squeak, squeak of very, very cold snow that you get. The other neat thing I found was the ice. It was this beautiful greeny blue with um, all of these little air bubbles frozen in it. That's myself in the lead and my little team. And we finally get to the Summit Lake Emergency Shelter, which we camped at that night. Now we didn't use, that's a, actually a warden's shelter, and we didn't have keys to them, so we couldn't get into them. But any of the little emergency huts, which were very small, we could go into. But it only really fit two people, so like, who would go in there, really? So, and they, they weren't nearly as warm as our tents were. And here's our next day. Now, I've done, as somebody's probably said, uh, a lot of very neat things in my life. I feel very blessed to have had the opportunities that I've had, but this day was one of my favorite days in my whole life, believe it or not. So this is where we headed from Summit Lake and we started down the Weasel River. And it was awesome. It was like a whitewater run on a frozen river. You can see the sort of start of the descent there. Your little sled would be bobbing along beside you and it was actually really fun. You can see the gang coming down. It was a totally gorgeous day, maybe minus 20, so not quite as, as cold. And when we actually got to the river part where it was totally frozen, it was like nothing to pull your sled. It was extremely easy. It was like doing a class two whitewater run, only on your boots instead of in a canoe. Because you had to maneuver around rocks, kind of go around corners, figure out how to get your sled to go where it wanted to and not where you didn't want it to go. And I could see everybody was just having an amazing time. Like, you could hear laughter and, can you see the drop there? Like, this must just be raging in the summertime. And we are just slipping our way down. The other thing I found fascinating, being a whitewater canoeist as well, is you'd see these big, it looked like a big boil, had just flash frozen in a boil. Like it would just be, it's like, wow, isn't that cool? It's just like a big boil there. The other thing we'd get occasionally are what was called overflow, and that's when we'd get some seepage 
of water from below that would just skim across the top of the ice. So in those situations, we try to avoid that as much as possible to keep our boots dry and to keep our sleds as dry as possible. Um, but th those were only a few spots that we came up with that. But you can see how spectacular it was. And as I said, it, to me, I would have liked this day to go on forever. It was one of those ones that you didn't really want to stop because you know that these experiences just don't happen all the time and you really want to hold on to them and cherish those moments. So our last corner before we get to um, the campsite that we wanted to have, which is right by Mount Thor, that's the one with the big vertical face of 5,000 feet. And we set up, that's my cooking shelter looking over Mount Thor and the frozen river below. There was minimal snow here, so all of our tents were sort of jammed into one little spot. And a couple of photos from my evening hike and this night, actually, as I came down and went past the tents, I just heard all of this laughter. It's like, what's going on? I stuck my head into Katya's cooking shelter, and they were playing some silly game and just laughing away. And I thought, here we are, in the middle of nowhere, not another person around us for hundreds of miles. And this is supposed to be an Arctic challenge, but they're, they're, they're giggling away. And it was very nice to see that. The next day was quite different. Uh, we had what I would call ice fog. So it wasn't temperature-wise that much colder, but it was damp. And there was just this little, all these little ice crystals in the air, which made it seem quite a lot colder. The river narrowed down quite a lot. It was, and we were hiking between these moraines on either side. Now, one of the things that this company lease plan had done beforehand, without the team members knowing, is that they'd had their family members, their husbands or boyfriends or whomever, partners, write them a letter and put pictures in with the letter of either their kids or whatever. And on this day, it was decided that they would, we would give out these letters and have them open it. So each person got the opportunity to read this letter of encouragement that had come from their kids or their husbands or whatever. Oh, and there was tears, hugs. It was a very uh, moving experience. We sat there for probably an hour as each person shared their letter with the rest of the team. I wondered what this would create, what feeling it would create, whether it would feel, create homesickness, which we had been through already, or whether it would inspire them and really it seemed to bring them even closer together and inspire them to you know really enjoy the rest of the trip. We continued down and we were getting to a place called Windy Lake which was aptly named Windy Lake because it was pretty windy and uh, that we set up just beside uh, in, in the protection of a little promontory there right by the river. Um, I had mentioned about the water and having to melt snow or ice, and we always preferred to melt ice rather than snow because it just melts much, you know, much easier. And we did have one of these poles. You can get them up in the north, but they're kind of like a chipper thing. And so one of us would always go out, and we had three IKEA bags, you know, those blue IKEA bags you can buy, and we would chip enough to fill an entire IKEA bag for each cooking shelter, and that's what we would use to make our water each day. <clears throat> and that's from my evening walk looking down at the Windy Lake Emergency Shelter, which is there, and the Windy Lake Warden's Cabin, which is there. And the next day, we headed downstream. So we did get into a little bit of Arctic yoga, that's downward husky dog, <laughs> and that is warrior Mount Thor. <laughs> and uh, then we continued on down. So just below Windy Lake, you get to the Arctic Circle. So we were crossing from the north of the Arctic Circle and heading south. So the Arctic Circle, as you know, is the actual line where at, um, on the winter solstice, it's completely dark, 
and the summer solstice, you've got 24 hours of daylight. And so here is the team happily at the Arctic Circle. We were lucky to have a beautiful day. That's myself and Katya. Jane was somewhere random, sorry. And we were breathing a little bit of a sigh of relief because we knew we were within two days track of the end of our trip and that it was going to be a success. So from there, um, negotiating another rapid down. And again, with all the wind in this area and because of the amount of glaciation and glacial silt, we did get a lot of sand and glacial dirt in the snow. So it didn't mean our dragging was easy, even though it looked like, it looks like um, smooth ice, a lot of it had sand mixed in with it. So we really did pick our route pretty carefully. Um, our last night at camp, and here we are in our cooking shelter, that's Charlotte. And she was making our mousse with chocolate and Baileys. That was a really big hit. It doesn't look so good, but did it ever taste good on night number 12? <laughs> Carrie, who's a mother of two, says, hmm, do you think we're allowed to have alcohol on this trip? I said, I think so. <laughs> And that's Annie, and she's of East Indian background who lives in London, England, and she'd been married for only a month, and she's kind of a princess, but she definitely got into the trip and experienced many, many things that uh, she wouldn't have thought herself capable of. So the next morning, again, looks pretty chilly out there, doesn't it? And um, Jane had brought um, some Inuit legends, and so before we headed off on our last day's trek, Jane wanted to do a little reading from this, um, this book of legends, which allowed us to put into perspective some of the things that we experienced and what some of the Inuit in the past would have experienced in this area. So that was a very interesting way to have our final morning. So I think everybody knew and were pretty excited about getting to the end at Overlord. Quite a few pictures being taken. And here's Katya and Jane looking out and you can actually see where Overlord is at the end, probably a kilometer or two away. And the gang kind of staged a bit of a fun photograph before walking together the last kilometer. So here is the emergency shelter at Overlord, and we knew that there were going to be some Inuit there waiting for us with their snow machines to take us into Pangnertung. But what the team didn't know was that Lease Plan actually had a welcome team come all the way from England to meet them. So they flew them over, and this is uh, Steve Moss, who's head of human resources, Haley Barnard. Um, and the three spares, they had three people who trained with the team in case somebody had to drop out for something. They flew all of them over for this final. So um, when they finally did it, there were huge tears of relief, tears of joy. Um, and then we loaded up our sleds onto the Comatix, loaded ourselves into the Comatix and onto the Skidoos, and it's about a two-hour snowmobile ride from, north, uh, from the Pangnertung Fjord into the town of Pangnertung. And that's our last tent, our last night at the Ayuitak Lodge with our sleds out front. Pangnertung's a nice little town. It's bigger than um, Kikatarjuak. It's about 800 people. And here we are in the dining room. You can see the sunburn on windburn on the faces. And then the next day in the Pangnertung airport, getting ready to fly south. So I feel incredibly honored to have had the opportunity to experience this with that team. Um, I give great thanks to my co-guys, Katya and Jane, and uh, Steve and the guys, uh, the human, human resources team at Least Plan for going along with this crazy idea. 
and particularly to the whole team, the whole group of ladies. They were absolutely awesome. They dug very deeply and they really uh, rose to the occasion. And uh, I always think when I see a, something like this that I hope the spirit of the Arctic gives us peace and strength. Thanks.